Peter was the founder of PayPal and Palantir and Founders Fund and has invested in uh, most of the tech companies in, in Silicon Valley. And he's going to talk about strategy and competition. Thank you for coming, Peter. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, Sam, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for, for having me. Uh, I, I sort of have a, I have a single idée fix that I'm completely obsessed with in, um, on, on the business side, which is that uh, if you're starting a company, if you're the founder, entrepreneur starting a company, you always want to aim for monopoly. And, um, and, that, uh, and you want to always avoid competition. And so, uh, hence, uh, competition is for losers, uh, something we'll be talking about today. I'd like to, um, I'd like to start by saying something about um, the, the, the basic idea of uh, when you start one of these companies, um, how you go about uh, creating value. And there's this question, what makes a business valuable? And I want to I suggest that there's basically a very simple, uh, very simple formula that um, um, you, you have a valuable company if two things are true. Uh, number one, that it creates X dollars of value for the world. And number two, that you capture Y percent of X. And, and the critical thing that, uh, that I think people always miss in the sort of analysis is that X and Y are completely independent variables. And so um, X can be very big, Y can be very small, X can be of intermediate size, and if Y is, is reasonably big, you can still get a very big business. So to create a valuable company, you have to basically uh, both create something of value and capture some fraction of the value of what you've created. And sort of just to just to illustrate uh, this as a, as a contrast, um, there's, if you sort of compare the uh, US airline industry with a company like uh, Google on search, uh, if you sort of measure by the size of these industries, you could, you could say that airlines are still more important than search. If you just measure it, say, by revenues, it was 195 billion in uh, domestic revenues in uh, 2000, uh, 2012. Google had uh, just north of 50 billion, um, and, this, and so, and certainly, sort of on some intuitive level, if you said, uh, if you were given a choice and said, well, do you want to get rid of air, all air travel, or do you want to get rid of your ability to use search engines, the intuition would be that air travel is something that's more important than search. And this is, of course, just the domestic numbers. If you looked at this globally, um, airlines are much, much bigger than um, than, uh, than 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 search or than Google is. But, uh, but the profit margins are quite a bit less. Uh, you know, they were marginally profitable in 2012. Uh, I think the entire 100-year history of the airline industry, the cumulative profits in the US have been approximately zero. You know, companies make money, they episodically go bankrupt, they get recapitalized, and you sort of cycle and, and repeat. And this is reflected in you know, the, the combined market capitalization of the, of the airline industries, maybe uh, something um, of the US airline industry, something like a quarter that of Google. So, so uh, you, have, you have a search engine much, much smaller than, than air travel, but much more valuable. And I think this, this reflects these very different uh, valuations on X and Y. So um, you know, if we look at perfect competition, um, you know, there are sort of, there's some pros and cons to the world of perfect competition. Um, on a high level, uh, uh, it's always, um, this is what you study in Econ 1. It's always, it's easy to model, which I think is why econ professors like talking about perfect competition. Um, it somehow is efficient, especially in a world where things are static because you have all the consumer surplus gets captured by everybody. And, uh, and politically, it's uh, what, uh, what, we're, what we're told is good in our society, that you, you want to have competition, and this is somehow a good thing. Um, of course, there are a lot of negatives. Uh, it's, it's generally not that good if you're, you're, um, you're involved in anything that's hyper-competitive, um, because you often don't make money. I'll come back to this a little bit later. So, uh, so I think at one end of the spectrum, you have uh, industries that are perfectly competitive. And at the other end of the spectrum, um, you have things that um, I would say are monopolies, and um, and they're you know they're much stable, longer-term businesses. You have more capital, uh, and um, and if you get a creative monopoly for inventing something new, I think it's symptomatic of having created something something really valuable. Um, and so I do think this you know the the, the sort of the, the the extreme binary 
view of the world I, I always articulate is that there are exactly two kinds of businesses in this world. There are businesses that are perfectly competitive, and there are businesses that are monopolies. And um, there's shockingly little that is in between. And uh, this dichotomy is not understood very well because uh, people uh, are constantly lying about the nature of the businesses they're in. Um, and this is why this is, in my mind, this is the most important, it's not necessarily the most important thing in business, but I think it's the most important business idea that people don't understand, that there are just these two kinds of businesses. And so let me say a little bit about the lies that people tell. And so you basically, um, the basic, uh, if you sort of imagine that there was a spectrum of companies from perfect competition to monopoly, um, the, um, the apparent differences are quite small because the people who have monopolies pretend not to. They will basically say, uh, you know, and it's because you don't want to get regulated by the government, you don't want the government to come after you, so you will never say that you have monopoly. So anyone who has a monopoly will pretend that they're in incredible competition. And on the other end of the spectrum, if you are incredibly competitive, um, and if you're in some sort of business where you will never make any money, um, you will be tempted to tell a lie that goes in the other direction, where you will say that you're doing something unique um, that um, is, is somehow uh, less competitive than it looks, because, um, because you, want to, you will want to differentiate, you want to try to attract capital, or something like that. So if the monopolists pretend not to have monopolies, the non-monopolists pretend to have monopolies, the apparent difference is very small, whereas the real difference, I would, I would submit, is, is actually quite big. And so there's this distortion that happens because of the lies people tell about their businesses, and the lies are sort of in these, these opposite directions. Let me, let me drill a little bit down further on the, uh, the way these lies work. And so, um, you know, the, the, the basic uh, lie you tell as a non-monopoly is that we're in a very small market. The basic lie you tell as a monopoly is that the market you're in is much bigger than it looks. And so, um, and so typically, if you want to think of this in sort of set theoretic terms, you could say that a monopoly tells um, a, a lie where you describe your business as the union of these vastly different markets, and the uh, non-monopolist describes it as the intersection. So that, uh, in effect, um, if you're, if you're a non-monopolist, you will rhetorically describe your market as super small. You're the only person in that market. If you have a monopoly, you will describe it as super big, and, um, and there's lots of competition in it. So uh, some examples of how this, how this works in practice. Uh, so I always use restaurants as the example of a terrible business. And this is always you know, sort of my idea is that you know, capitalism and competition are antonyms. Um, capitalist is someone who accumulates capital. A world of perfect competition is a world where all the capital gets competed away. So uh, you're opening a restaurant business. No one wants to invest because you just lose money. So you have to tell some idiosyncratic narrative. And you'll say something like, well, we're the only British food restaurant in Palo Alto. So it's British, Palo Alto. And, uh, and of course, that's too small a market because people may be able to drive all the way to Mountain View or even Menlo Park. Um, and there probably are no people who eat nothing but British food, at least no people who are still alive. <laughs> and so, so that is, um, that's, that's a sort of a fictitiously narrow market. Um, there's, there's sort of a Hollywood version of this where uh, the way movies always get pitched is, you know, okay, it's like a college football star you know, uh, joins an elite group of hackers to, um, to catch the shark that killed his friend. Um, sorry. And so that's, tr now that is a movie that has not yet been made. <laughs> but, um, but, but the question is, is, is that the right category or is the correct category, it's just another movie? In which case, you know, there are lots of those. It's super competitive, incredibly hard to make money. No one ever makes money in Hollywood uh, doing movies. It's really, really hard. And so you always have this question about, does the intersection, does, is it real? Does it make sense? Does it have value that one should ask? And of course, there are startup versions of this where you, and the, the sort of the bad, really bad versions, you just take a whole series of uh, buzzwords, sharing mobile social apps, you combine them, and you have some kind of uh, narrative. And whether or not that's a real business or not uh, is, is, uh, um, is it's generally a bad sign. So it's, it's almost this pattern recognition when you have this re rhetoric of 
the sort of intersections, um, it, it, it generally does not work. The something of somewhere is really mostly just the nothing of nowhere. And it's like the Stanford of North Dakota. <laughs> uh, one of a kind, but it's not Stanford. Um, so let's look at the opposite. The opposite lie is um, if you are, uh, let's say, uh, the, uh, the search uh, company uh, that's down the street from here and has about a happy 66% market share um, and uh, is, you know, is completely dominant in the search market, um, Google has not dis to, almost never describes itself as a search engine these days. Um, and instead, it, uh, it describes itself in all these different ways. So it sometimes says it's an advertising company. So if it was search, you'd say, wow, it's, it's like, it's, it's, it has this huge market share that's really, really crazy. It's, it's like an incredible monopoly. It's much bigger than, it's much, a much more robust monopoly than Microsoft ever had in the 90s. Maybe that's why it's making so much money. Um, but if you, uh, if you say it's an advertising market, you could say, well, there's search advertising is 17 billion, and that's part of uh, online advertising, which is much bigger, and then you know, all US advertising is bigger, and then by the time you get to global advertising, that's close to 500 billion. And so you're talking about 3.5%. So um, a tiny part of, uh, of this much larger market. Um, or uh, if you don't want to be an advertising company, you can always say that you're a technology company. Um, and so, um, sorry, let me just see. Um, and so the, and, and so, um, and, and the technology market is something like a $1 trillion market. And uh, the narrative that you tell as Google in the, in the technology market is, um, well, we're competing with uh, all the car companies with our self-driving cars. We're competing with Apple on TVs and iPhones. Uh, we're competing with Facebook. We're competing with Microsoft on, um, on office products. We're competing with Amazon on cloud services. And so we are in this giant technology market where there's competition in every direction uh, you, you look. And uh, no, we're not the monopoly the government's looking for. And we should not get regulated in any way whatsoever. And so I think one has to always be super aware that there are these, uh, these very powerful incentives to, uh, to distort uh, the nature of these markets one way or, or the other. So um, you know, the, the, the evidence of narrow markets in the, uh, in the tech industry is, um, is if you basically just, uh, if you look at sort of the, some of the big tech companies, Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, um, they just, um, they've just been building up cash for um, year after year, and you have these incredibly high profit margins. And I would, I would say that, the, that one of the reasons the tech industry in the US has been, uh, has been so successful financially is because it's, it's prone to creating all these monopoly-like businesses. And, that's, that's, um, and it's reflected uh, by the fact that these companies just accumulate so much cash, they don't even know what, what to do with it beyond a certain point. Um, and so, so let me say, um, let me say a few things about, uh, about how, to, how to build a monopoly. And I think, uh, I think the, one of the sort of very counterintuitive ideas that comes out of this monopoly uh, thread is that um, you want to go after small markets. If you're a startup, um, you know, you want to get to a monopoly. You're starting a new company, you want to get to monopoly. Um, Monopoly is you have a large share of a market. How do you get to a large share of a market? You start with a really small market and you take over that whole market. And then, uh, and then over time, you find ways to expand that market in, in concentric circles. And uh, the thing that's always a big mistake is going after a giant market on, uh, on day one. Because that's typically evidence that, um, that you somehow haven't defined the categories correctly. That the, and it's, it normally means that there's going to be too much competition in one way or another. And so I think almost all the uh, successful companies uh, in Silicon Valley had some model of starting with small markets and expanding. And you know, if you take Amazon, you start with, you start with you know, just um, a bookstore. We have all the books in the world, so it's, it's a... It's a it's a better bookstore than anybody else has in the world when it starts in the 90s. It's online. There's things you can do you can't do before. And then you gradually expand into all sorts of different forms of e-commerce and other things beyond that. 
Um, you know, eBay, you start with Pez dispensers, you move on to Beanie Babies, and eventually uh, it's, it's all these different um, auctions for all these sorts of different goods. Um, and, uh, and what was very counterintuitive about What's very counterintuitive about many of these companies is they often start with markets that are so small that people don't think um, they don't think that they're uh, valuable at all when when you get started. Um, the the PayPal version of this was uh, was you know we started with uh, with power sellers on eBay, which was about twenty thousand people. When, when we first saw this happening in December of ninety nine, January two thousand, right after we launched, uh, there was a sense that. Uh, that these were all, um, it was such a small market, it was terrible, we thought these were terrible customers to have, it's just people selling junk on the internet, why in the world do we want to be going after this market? But, um, but you, you know, you, there was a way to get a product that was much better for everybody in that market, you could, um, and we got to something like 25, 30% you know, market penetration in two or three months, and you got some lock-in, you got brand recognition, and you're able to, to build the business from there. So, um, so I always think, these, um, these, these very small markets are, are quite underrated. Uh, the Facebook version of this I always give is that uh, you know, the initial market at Facebook was 10,000 people at Harvard. It went from zero to 60% market share in 10 days. That was a very auspicious start. Um, the way this gets analyzed in business schools is always, um, that's ridiculous, it's such a small market, it can't have any value at all. And so I think the business school analysis of Facebook early on or of uh, PayPal early on, or of eBay early on, is that the markets were perhaps so small as to have uh, almost no value. Uh, and they, they would have had little value had they stayed small, but it turned out there were ways to then grow them concentrically, and uh, that's, what made them, uh, that's what made them so valuable. Um, now, I think the opposite version of this is always where you have super big markets. And, um, and I, there's so, much, so many different things that went wrong with all the clean tech companies in the last decade, but, uh, but one, one theme that ran through almost all of them was they all started with massive markets. And every clean tech PowerPoint presentation that one saw in the years 2005 to 2008, which was sort of the clean tech bubble in, in Silicon Valley, started with, we're in the energy market, we're in a market that's measured in hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars, and, um, and then you know, once you're sort of a, a minnow in a vast ocean, um, that's not a good place to be. That means that you have tons of competitors and you don't even know who all the competitors are. And so you want to be, you know, you want to be a one-of-a-kind company where it's the only one in a small ecosystem. You don't want to be the fourth online pet food company. You don't want to be the tenth uh, thin film solar panel company. You don't want to be the hundredth restaurant in Palo Alto. Um, your restaurant industry is a trillion dollar industry. So if you do a market size analysis, you conclude restaurants are a fantastic business to go into. And it's often large markets, large existing markets typically mean that you have uh, tons of competition, very, very hard to, uh, to differentiate. So the first very counterintuitive into, uh, idea is, is to go after small markets, often markets that are so small people don't even notice them, they don't think that they make sense. That's where you get a foothold, and then, um, and then if those markets are able to expand, you can uh, scale uh, into a, a, a big monopoly business. Um, you know, a, um, a second uh, sort of, there's sort of several different uh, characteristics of these monopoly businesses um, that I like to um, focus on, and uh, there's probably no, no sort of single formula to it. And I, I always think that, uh, that in technology, there's always a sense that you know, the history of technology is such that every, every moment happens only once. And so you know, the next Mark Zuckerberg won't build a social network. The next, uh, uh, the next Larry Page won't be building a search engine. The next uh, Bill Gates won't be building an operating system. And if you're copying these people, you're not learning from them. But it's, it's, and so um, there is always um, these very unique businesses that are doing something that's not been done before end up um, end up having the potential to be a monopoly. If you're, you know, the, 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 opening, the opening line in um, Anna Karenina is that all happy companies, sorry, all happy families, all happy families are alike, all unhappy families are unhappy in their own special way. And the opposite is true in business where I think all happy companies are different because they're doing something very unique. All unhappy companies are alike because they fail to escape the essential sameness that is competition. And so, so one, one sort of 
characteristic of a monopoly technology company is some sort of proprietary technology. Um, my sort of crazy, somewhat arbitrary rule of thumb is you want to have a technology that's an order of magnitude better than the next best thing. So Amazon had over 10 times as many books. I mean, it's maybe not that high tech, but you figure out a way to sell 10 times as many books in an efficient online way. You know, PayPal, the alternative for PayPal was using, um, was using uh, uh, checks to uh, send money on eBay. It took seven to 10 days to clear. PayPal could do it more than 10 times as fast. So you want to have some sort of very, uh, very powerful improvement in some, um, on, on, in some order, maybe an order of magnitude improvement on some key dimension. Um, of course, you know, if, you, if you actually come with something totally new, um, it's, it's, just, it's just like an infinite improvement. So I would say the, the iPhone was the first smartphone that worked. And so that's, you know, that's like maybe, in, maybe not infinite, but it's sort of definitely an order of magnitude or more of an improvement. So I think uh, the, the technology is designed to give you a massive delta over, over the, next, the next best thing. I think, um, I think there often are network effects that can kick in that, uh, that really help. The thing that's very, um, and these, these lead to monopolies over time, the thing that's very tricky about network effects is uh, they're, often, uh, they're often very hard to get started. And so, um, so even though everyone understands how valuable they are, uh, there's always this incredibly tricky question, why is it valuable to the first person who's doing something? Um, economies of scale, uh, if you have something with very high fixed costs, very low marginal costs, uh, that's typically a monopoly-like business. And then, um, then there's this thing uh, of, of branding, uh, which is sort of like just uh, th this idea that gets lodged in people's brains. I, I never quite understand how branding works. Uh, so I never invest in companies where it's just about branding. But it is, I think, uh, a real phenomenon that, uh, that, creates, uh, that creates real value. I think one of the things, um, I'm going to come back to this a little bit uh, towards the end, but one of the things that's very striking is that software businesses are often, um, are for some reason, uh, very good at some of these things. They're especially good at the economies of scale part because uh, the marginal cost of software is zero. And so if you get something that works in software, um, it's often significantly better than the existing solution. And then you have these tremendous economies of scale, and you can scale fairly quickly. So even if the market starts small, um, you can grow your business quickly enough to uh, stay, um, stay at the same size as the growing market and, uh, and maintain the sort of monopoly uh, power. Now, the critical thing about these monopolies is, um, is it's, it's not enough to have a monopoly for just a moment. The critical thing is to have one that lasts over time. Um, and so, you know, in Silicon Valley, there's always this sort of idea that you want to be the first mover. And I, I always think it's, it's in some ways, um, the better framing is you want to be the last mover. You want to be the last company in a category. Those are the ones that are really valuable. Microsoft was the last operating system, at least for many decades. Uh, Google is the last search engine. Facebook will be valuable if it turns out to be the last uh, social networking site. And, um, and one, way to, one way to think of this uh, last mover uh, value is this idea that most of the value in these companies exists far in the future. Um, if you do sort of a discounted cash flow analysis of a business, you look at, you have sort of all these profit streams, you have a growth rate, the growth rate's much higher than the discount rate, and so most of the value exists far in the future. I did, I did this exercise at PayPal in March of 2001. We had been in business for about 27 months, and, um, and we sort of had, you know, the growth rate was 100% a year, we were discounting future cash flows by about 30%, and it turned out that about Three quarters of the value of the business as of 2001 came from cash flows in years 2011 and beyond. And, um, and whenever you do the math on any of these tech companies, you get to an answer that's something like that. So if you are trying to analyze any of the tech companies in Silicon Valley, Airbnb, Twitter, uh, Facebook, um, any emerging internet companies, all the ones in Y Combinator, um, the math tells you that three quarters, 80, 85% of the value is coming from cash flows in years 2024 and beyond. It's very, very far in the future. And, uh, and so one of the things that uh, we always overvalue in Silicon Valley is growth rates, and we undervalue durability. Because uh, growth is something you can measure in the here and now, and you can always track that very precisely. 
Um, the question of whether a company's still going to be around a decade from now, that's actually what, what dominates the value equation. And that sort of is a much more uh, qualitative sort of a thing. And so if, if, we, um, if we went back to this idea of these characteristics of monopoly, uh, proprietary technology, network effects, economies of scale, um, um, you can think of these, these uh, characteristics as ones that exist at a moment in time where you capture a market and take it over. But you also want to think about, are these things going to last over time? And so there's a time dimension to all these characteristics. So network effects often have a great time element where as the network scales, the network effects actually get more robust. And so if you have a network effect business, that's often one that uh, um, can become a, um, a, a bigger and stronger monopoly over time. Uh, proprietary technology is always a little bit of a tricky one. So you want something that's an order of magnitude better than uh, the state of the art in the world today. And that's how you get people's attention. That's how you initially break through. But then um, you don't want to be superseded by somebody else. And so there are all these areas of innovation where uh, there was tremendous innovation, but no one made any money. So uh, you know, disk drive manufacturing in the 1980s. Um, you could, imp you could do a better disk, build a better disk drive than anybody else. You could take over the whole world. And two years later, someone else would come along and replace yours. And in the course of 15 years, you got vastly improved disk drives. So it had great benefit to consumers. But um, it didn't actually help the people who started these companies. And so there's always this uh, question about having a huge breakthrough in technology, but then also being able to say, explain why uh, yours will be the last breakthrough, uh, or at least the last breakthrough for a long time. Or will you make a breakthrough, and then you can keep improving on it at a quick enough pace that no one can ever catch up. So if you have a structure of, um, a structure of the future where there's a lot of innovation and other people will come up with new things in the thing you're working on, um, that's great for society. It's, um, it's actually not that good for your business, typically. Um, and then um, economies of scale, uh, we already talked about. So, so I think, anyway, so I think this last mover thing is, is very critical. I'm always tempted, you know, uh, I don't want to overdo the chess analogies, but you know, the first mover in chess is someone who plays white. White is about a one third of a pawn advantage. So there's a small advantage to uh, going first. You want to be the last mover um, who, who wins the game. And so, so there's always the Capablanca uh, world champion, uh, uh, chess champion Capablanca line. You must begin by studying the end game. And, uh, and I do think that's, um, well, I, I wouldn't say that's the only thing you should study. I think this, uh, this sort of perspective of asking these questions, why will this still be the leading company 10, 15, 20 years from now, is a, uh, is a really critical one to, to try to think through. Let me, um, let me sort of, uh, I want to sort of go in two slightly other directions with this uh, monopoly versus competition idea. And I think, um, so I, th I think this is the, the central idea uh, in my mind for, for business, for starting business, for thinking about them. And, uh, and there are some, some very um, interesting perspectives I think it gives on the whole, you know, on the whole history of innovation and technology and science. Because um, you know, we've, we've lived through, um, we've lived through uh, you know, 250, 300 years of incredible technological progress in you know, many, many different domains, uh, you know, steam engine to railways to telephones, refrigeration, household appliances, um, you know, the computer revolution, aviation, all sorts of different areas of technological innovation. And then there's sort of analogous thing that one can say about science, where uh, we've lived through centuries of, of enormous amounts of innovation in, in, in science as well. And, um, and the, the thing that I think um, people always miss when they think about these things is, um, is that um, because x and y are independent variables, um, some of these things can be extremely valuable innovations, but uh, the people who invent them, who come up with them, do not get rewarded for this. And, uh, and certainly, if you go back to, um, you need to create x dollars in value, you capture y percent of x. I would suggest that the history of science has generally been one where y is 0% across the board. The scientists never make any money. Um, they're always deluded into thinking that they live in a just universe that will reward them for their work and for their inventions. And this is probably the fundamental delusion that, uh, that scientists uh, tend to suffer from in our, in our society. Um, and, and even in technology, 
there are sort of many different areas of technology where, um, where there were great innovations that created tremendous value for society. But, uh, but people uh, did, not, uh, did not actually capture uh, that much of the, of the value. And so I think there is this sort of whole uh, history of um, science and technology that can be told from the perspective of how much value was actually captured. And, um, and certainly, there are entire sectors where people didn't capture anything. So you, you're the smartest physicist of the 20th century. You come up with special relativity. You come up with general relativity. You don't get to be a billionaire. You don't even get to be a millionaire. Um, it, just, it just somehow doesn't work that way. Um, the railroads, incredibly valuable. Most of them just went bankrupt because it was too much competition. Um, Wright brothers, um, you fly the first plane. You don't make any money. And so I think there is sort of a structure to these industries that's, uh, that's very important. Um, and I think the, uh, the thing that's actually rare are the success cases. Most of the, so it's actually, when you, when you really think about the history in this, in this 250 year sweep, um, it's unusual, Y is almost always 0%. It's always zero in science. It's almost always in, in technology. And so it's very rare where people made money. You know, the early, uh, the late uh, 18th, early 19th century, the first industrial revolution was the textile mills, you had the steam engine, you sort of automated things, and you had these relentless improvements that people improved efficiency of textile factories, of manufacturing generally, at a clip of five to seven percent every year, year after year, decade after decade. You had 60, 70 years of tremendous improvement from 1780 to 1850. Um, but even in 1850, most of the wealth in Britain was still held by the landed aristocracy. Uh, the, workers didn't, you know, the workers didn't make that much. The capitalists didn't make that much either. It was all competed away. There were hundreds of people running textile factories. It was an industry that just uh, um, the structure of the competition prevented people uh, from, from making any money. Um, and so I think there are, in my mind, there are probably are only two broad categories in the entire history of the last 250 years where people have actually uh, come up with new things and made money doing so. Um, one is uh, these sort of vertically integrated complex monopolies, which people uh, did build in the second industrial revolution at the end of the 19th and start of the 20th century. And so this was like Ford. It was the vertically integrated oil companies like Standard Oil. Um, and what these uh, vertically integrated monopolies uh, typically required was this very complex coordination. You got a lot of pieces to fit together in just the right way. Uh, when you assembled it, you had a, a tremendous advantage. This is actually uh, done surprisingly little today. And so I think this is sort of a business form that um, when people can pull it off is very valuable. It's typically fairly capital intensive. Uh, we live sort of in a, in, a, in a culture where it's very hard to get people to buy into anything that's uh, super complicated and takes very long to build. Uh, but I, you know, when, when I sort of think about my colleague Elon uh, Musk from PayPal's success with Tesla and SpaceX, uh, I think the key to these companies was the complex, vertically integrated monopoly structure they had. So if you sort of look at Tesla or SpaceX, if you ask, you know, was there sort of a single breakthrough? I mean, they certainly innovated on a lot of dimensions. I don't think there was a single 10x breakthrough you know, in battery storage or, you know, uh, maybe working on some things on rocketry, but they hadn't, there was no sort of single massive breakthrough. But what was really impressive was integrating all these pieces together and, um, and doing it in a way that was more vertically integrated than most of their competitors. So Tesla, you also integrated the car distributors so they wouldn't uh, steal all the money as has happened with the rest of the car industry in the US. Or SpaceX, um, you basically uh, pulled in all the subcontractors um, uh, where most of the large uh, aerospace companies have single source subcontractors that are able to sort of charge uh, monopoly profits and make it very hard for the integrated aerospace companies to make money. Um, and so uh, vertical integration, I think, is sort of a, a very underexplored uh, modality of, of uh, technological progress that people uh, would, uh, would do well to look at more. And then I think there is, there is something about software itself that's very, very powerful. Um, software has these incredible economies of scale, these low marginal costs. And there is something about the world of bits as opposed to the world of atoms where you can often get very fast adoption. And, and the fast adoption is critical to capturing and taking over markets because even if you have a small market, if the adoption rate is too slow, there'll be enough time for other people to enter that market and compete with you. Whereas if you have 
a small to mid-sized market and have a fast adoption rate, you can uh, take over this market. And so, and so I think this is one of the reasons Silicon Valley has done so well and why uh, software has been uh, this phenomenal industry. And what I, what I would suggest, uh, what I would want to leave you with is there are sort of these different rationalizations people give for why certain things work and why certain things don't work. And I think these rationalizations always obscure this question of um, creating X dollars in value and capturing Y percent of X. So the science rationalization we're always told is that the scientists aren't interested in making money. They're doing it for charitable reasons and that you're not a good scientist if you're motivated by money. And I'm not even saying people should always be motivated by money or something like this, but I, I think we should, we should be a little bit more critical of this as a rationalization. We should ask, is this a rationalization um, uh, to obscure the fact that y equals zero percent, and the scientists are operating in this uh, in this sort of world where all the uh, all the innovation is effectively competed away, and they can't capture any of it directly. And then the uh, the software distortion that often happens is because people are making such vast fortunes in software, we infer that this is the most valuable thing um, in the world being done. Full stop. And so if people at Twitter make uh, billions of dollars, it must be that Twitter is worth far more than anything Einstein did. Um, and, um, and, uh, and what that sort of rationalization tends to obscure is again that X and Y are independent variables and there are these businesses where you capture a lot of X and there are others where you don't. And so, uh, and so I, do think, um, I do think the history of innovation has been this, uh, this history where uh, the, 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 the microeconomics, the structure of these industries has mattered a tremendous amount and when um, and um, and 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 there is sort of this this story where some people have made vast fortunes because they were in industries with the right structure, and other people uh, made uh, nothing at all because um, because they were in these sort of very competitive things. And we shouldn't just rationalize that way. I think it's worth understanding this better. And then finally, let me come back to this this uh, this sort of overarching theme for this talk: this competition is for losers idea, which. Um, is always this provocative way to, to title things because we always think of the losers as the people who are not good at competing. We think of the losers as the people who are um, slow on the sports on the track team in high school or who do a little bit less well on the standardized tests um, and don't get into the right schools. And so we always think of losers as people who can't compete. Um, and I want us to really rethink and, and revalue this and consider whether it's possible that competition itself um, is off, that we, we, we're sort of, it's not just the case that we don't understand this monopoly competition dichotomy intellectually. So that's what I've been talking about, why, why you wouldn't understand it intellectually because um, people lie about it, it's distorted. We have all these, uh, the history of innovation rationalizes what's happened in all these very, very strange ways. But I think it's more than just an intellectual blind spot. I think it's also a psychological blind spot where we find ourselves you know, very, very attracted to competition in, in one form or another. Um, we find it reassuring if other people do things. The word ape already in the time of Shakespeare meant both primate and imitate. Uh, and there is something about human nature that's deeply mimetic, imitative, ape-like, sheep-like, lemming-like, herd-like. Um, and it's this very, very problematic uh, thing that uh, we need to always think through and, and try to overcome. And, and there is always this question about um, competition um, as, as a form of validation where we, we go for things that lots of other people are going for. And um, it's not that there is wisdom in crowds. It's not when lots of people are trying to do something that that's proof of uh, it being valuable. I think it's when lots of people are trying to do something that is often, um, that is often proof of insanity. There are 20,000 people a year who move to Los Angeles to become movie stars. About 20 of them make it. Um, I think the Olympics are a little bit better because you have a, you know, um, you can sort of figure out pretty quickly whether you're good or not. So it's a, there's a little bit less of a dead weight loss to society. Um, you know, um, um, you know, you're, you're, you're the sort of educational experience at a place, uh, the, the, the pre-Stanford educational experience, um, there's always sort of a non-competitive characterization where I think most of the people in this room had machine guns and they were competing with people with bows and arrows. So um, it wasn't exactly a parallel competition when you were in junior high school and high school. Um, there's always a question, does the tournament make sense as you keep going? And this is, uh, and so um, there is always this question if people go on to grad school or post-doctoral uh, post educations, does the intensity of the competition really make sense? There's the, 
uh, the you know, classic uh, Henry Kissinger line that uh, um, describing his fellow faculty at, at Harvard that the, uh, um, the battles were so ferocious because the stakes were so small, describing sort of academia. And, um, and, and you sort of think on one level, this is a description of insanity. You know, why would people fight like crazy when the stakes are so small? But it's also, I think, simply a function of the logic of the situation. When it's really hard to differentiate yourself from other people, when the differences are, when the objective differences really are small, then uh, you have to uh, compete ferociously to maintain uh, a difference of one sort uh, or another um, that's often more imaginary than real. There's always sort of a personal uh, version of this that I, I tell where um, you know, I was sort of hyper, hyper tracked. I, you know, my eighth grade junior high school yearbook, one of my friends wrote in, you know, I, I know you'll get into Stanford in four years as a, as a sophomore. I sort of went into, went to Stanford four years later uh, at the end of high school, uh, went to Stanford Law School, uh, you know, ended up um, at a big law firm in uh, New York uh, where from the outside everybody wanted to get in, on the inside everybody wanted to leave. Um, and, and you had, um, and it was this very strange dynamic where after I uh, sort of realized this was maybe not the best idea, um, and I left after seven months and three days, you know, one of the people down the hall from me uh, told me, um, it's really reassuring to see you leave, Peter. I had no idea that it was possible to escape from Alcatraz, which of course, all you had to do was go out the front door and not come back. But, um, but so much of people's identities got wrapped up in, um, in winning uh, these competitions that uh, they somehow lost sight of what was important, what was valuable. Uh, you know, competition does make you better at whatever it is that you're competing on. Because when you're competing, you're um, comparing yourself with the people around you. You're figuring out, how do I beat the people next to me? How do I do somewhat better at whatever it is they're doing? And you will get better at that thing. I'm not, I'm not questioning that. I'm not denying that. But, um, but it often comes at this tremendous price that uh, you stop asking some bigger questions about what's truly important and truly valuable. And so I would, I would say that uh, don't always go through the tiny little door that everyone's trying to rush through. Uh, maybe go around the corner and go through the vast gate that no one's taking. Thank you very much. I guess we have time for, do you want to take a few questions? Or? Sorry? Oh, yeah, uh, if people want to take, I'll take a few questions. We have a few minutes' time. Yeah, go ahead. Since, yeah, as you mentioned earlier, often monopolies and perfect competition often look similar because the narratives people tell or the narratives we tell ourselves. How, do you have any ways to easily uh, determine the difference when you're looking at an idea or evaluating your own idea? Well, I, I'd say the question I'm, I always try to focus on is what is the actual market? So not what's the narrative of the market? Because you can always tell a fictional story about a market that's much bigger or much smaller. But what is the, what is the real objective market? So it's always, yeah, you always try to figure it out. And you realize people have incentives to powerfully distort these things. Yeah? So which of the aspects of monopolies that you mentioned would you say that software companies like Google or um, Well, they have. Uh, they have network effects with the, the ad network. They had proprietary technology that gave them the initial lead because they had the, uh, the page rank algorithm, which was uh, sort of an order of magnitude better than any other search, search engine. You have economies of scale uh, because of the need to store you know, all these different uh, sites. And at this point, you have brands. So Google has all four. Maybe, maybe the proprietary technology is somewhat weaker at this point. But definitely, it had all four and maybe three and a half out of four now. Yeah. How does this apply to Palantir and second? What's it like? The second is what? What's with the iPhone? Uh, headphone? Oh, this is that's a, that's a that's a this sort of a set of companies that are doing different copycat uh, payment systems on uh, on mobile phones. There's Square. There's PayPal. They sort of they have they're just they just have sort of different shapes. That's how they differentiate themselves. One is a triangle. One is a square. Um, and so you know um, maybe at some point the apes will run out of shapes or something like that. But um, but I think. Um, no, Palantir, we started with a focus on, on um, the um, intelligence community, which is a small sub-market. Um, you had a proprietary technology that used a very, very different approach, um, uh, where it was focused on the human um, computer uh, synthesis rather than the uh, uh, substitution, which I think is the dominant paradigm. So there's a whole set of things I would say on the, on the market approach and the, uh, on, and the proprietary technology. Uh, yes? Um, we have design thinking methodology and uh, lean uh, startup thinking. 
um, which is used to mitigate risk by not creating things that people don't want. But how do young innovators uh, have inspiration to create complex systems that last through time? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is, um, what I think about lean startups, uh, um, iterative thinking where you get uh, feedback from people uh, versus uh, complexity that may not work. So I, I am personally quite skeptical of all the uh, lean startup methodology. I think the, the, the really great companies um, did something that was sort of somewhat more of a quantum improvement that really differentiated them from everybody else. Um, they, did, they typically did not do massive you know, customer surveys. The people who ran these companies uh, sometimes not always suffered from mild forms of Asperger's, so they were not actually that influenced, not that easily deterred by what other people thought or told them to do. Um, so I do, I do think we're, we're way too focused on um, iteration as a modality and not enough on trying to um, have um, you know, um, a, a virtual ESP link with the public and figuring it out ourselves. Um, I, I would say that, uh, let me see, um, I, I would say that uh, the, um, I, I'm not quite, the risk question I think is always a very tricky one because there are, um, you know, there, there, it's, it's not, it's often, I think it's often the case that you don't have enough time to really mitigate risk. If, you, if you're going to take enough time to figure out what people want, um, you often will have missed the boat by then. Um, and, um, and then, of course, there's always the risk of, of doing something that's, uh, that's not that uh, significant or meaningful. So you, know, you, you could say a track in, um, in law school is a low-risk track from one perspective. It may still be a very high-risk track in the sense that maybe you not, um, have a high risk of not doing something meaningful with your life. So we have to think about risk in these, uh, in these very complicated ways. I think risk is sort of this very uh, complicated concept. Yes? As you talk about the last move your advantage, but then doesn't that imply that there's already competition to begin with on the chess piece, on the chess board? Um, yeah, so there's always this uh, terminology thing. So I would, I would say that uh, there, are, uh, there are categories in which people sort of are bundled together. I would say the monopoly businesses were, in, in effect, they, they really were a big first mover in some sense. You could say, you could say Google was not the first search engine. There were other search engines before. But on one dimension, they were dramatically better than everybody else. So they were the first one with page rank, with, with sort of an automated approach. Um, Facebook was not the first uh, social networking site. My friend Reid Hoffman started one in 1997. They called it SocialNet. So they already had the name social networking uh, in the name of their company seven years before Facebook. Uh, their idea was that it was going to be this virtual cyberspace where I'd be a dog and you'd be a cat. and We'd have all these different rules about how we'd interact with each other in this virtual alternate reality. Facebook was the first one to get real identity. So, it was, so I'd say I hope Facebook will be the last social networking site. It was the first one in, in a very important dimension. People often would not think of it as the first because they'd sort of uh, lump all these things together. Okay, one more question. Let's take one here. Uh, if you're theoretically someone who uh, worked at Goldman Sachs out of college and left that for six months and is now studying computer science at Stanford, uh, how would you recommend rethinking uh, sort of that competitive thing? <laughs> um, you know, I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a great. Um, I'm not great at the psychotherapy stuff, so I don't, I don't quite know how to. I don't quite know how to uh, how to solve this. There are these, um, you know, there are these very odd studies they've done on people who go to um, business school. There's one they've done at Harvard Business School, where um, it's sort of the anti Asperger um, personality, where you have people who are super extroverted, uh, generally have low convictions, a uh, few ideas, and you have sort of a hot house environment. You put all these people in for two years, and at the end of it, uh, they systematically end up. The largest cohort systematically ends up doing the wrong thing. They try to catch the last wave. You know, in uh, 1989, everyone at Harvard tried to work for Mike Milken. It was one or two years before he went to jail for uh, all the junk bond stuff. They were never interested in Silicon Valley or tech except for 99, 2000 when they timed the dot-com bubble peaking perfectly. Um, they did, uh, and then you know, 05 to 07 was housing, uh, private equity stuff like this. So, so I do think, um, I do think this. Uh, tendency for us to see competition as validation is um, is very deep. Um, 
I don't think there's some any sort of easy psychological formula to uh, to avoid it. So I don't I don't quite know how to uh, what sort of therapy to, to recommend. But um, but my 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 first my first starting point, which is only like it's maybe 10% of the way, is to never underestimate how big a problem it is. We always think this is something that afflicts other people. So it's easy for me to point to people in business schools or people at Harvard or people on Wall Street. I think it actually does afflict all of us to a very profound degree. We always think of advertising as things that work on other people. How, who are all these stupid people who fall for all those ads on TV? They obviously work to some extent, and they work uh, to a disturbing extent on all of us, and it's something we, we all should work to overcome. Thank you very much.